warm welcoming you back to this program, Think Tech Wise, uh, Human Humane Architecture. This happening to be our 344th show, and you're about 50 views away from being the 20,000th viewer, which we appreciate. So today, uh, we're going back to the fellow maritime metropolis of Barcelona. And we do this with uh, two uh, of our three uh, panelists here being eyewitnesses of a previous era, which was an autocratic totalitarian regime that we're all afraid all over the world to get back. To get back. And this gets us to you, J. Fidel, who has been there in 1965, and to you, Pedro Capriata, who uh, has some, as you just told us, some pixeled uh, early childhood memories of age five or six when you with your parents. I don't remember that okay. much of that visit, to be honest. But, enough, but I have a picture that proves I was here. <laughs> good enough. So we want to uh, go back to uh, Barcelona, literally and figuratively speaking. And today is also our Indigenous Day edition of this program here, which so far and still officially has been called inappropriately Columbus Day. And when we have this news here about the Catalan uh, news, I think, uh, Pedro, if you don't mind, uh, explain a little bit to us here in Hawaii what the difference is be between Spanian people from Spain in general uh, all over that country and people from Catalan, because we have a similar differentiation here, although much different with Hawaiians. I tell you here, uh, um, Pedro, very briefly, that if you... Uh, call yourself a Hawaiian, um, in a true sense, uh, your uh, ancestry lines need to trace all the way back to pre-contact, which, if I understand, isn't necessarily as sort of rigid with cut Catalans, right, that your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents needed to also have been living in this area, but certainly means to have, if I get that right, to have lived there permanently for a longer time. Do you apply with your 20 years there? Can you consider yourself or do they consider you a Catalan yet? Uh, yes, in many ways. I I speak Catalan, which is important, an uh, important integration. You know, uh, Lionel Messi, uh, <laughs> to mention a famous uh, adopted Catalan, uh, barely spoke any Catalan. <laughs> and he was here, I think, almost longer than me. Well, not longer than me because he's not that old, but uh, I think that's a crucial um, um, point to be considered uh, Catalan. And I don't know, it depends on the way you relate to people. But I would say that uh, most people would consider me like probably not a native Catalan, but just an adopted Catalan for sure. Yeah, and that reminds me, Jay, of uh, Kelly Aquina, uh, who always said, and since... I met him about a decade ago. He said, well, you're a Hawaiian to me because I don't care about your blood, but your spirit, as long as your spirit is with me and with my people, you're in. I prefer that over the hardcore fundamentalist, but that's just me. And maybe I'm just, you know, obviously subjective to that matter. Another crucial uh, fact, it's that I'm a Barca football team fan. And the, the, the anthem of the Barcelona club uh, says, uh, there's a, a line that says, it doesn't matter where you're from, literally. Yeah. yeah so I think this is, it, it gives you an idea of the spirit of the city. You know, if you, it doesn't matter really where you're from, uh, as long as you, of course, you, if you become a Barca fan, even better. But if you don't, if you speak Catalan, that's good enough for them. No, they, they know you make an effort to speak a language that, is not spoken in that many places. So among other things, it means that you intend to stay. Yeah, and we can, can call that cosmopolitan, but this article here points out it comes with a price, literally and figuratively speaking, because you're so welcoming, a lot of people might come. And my first time ever since a brief stint at my childhood as well, but my really first time was about three years ago in 2021 when my oldest son Joey and his partner Clara uh, were there for more than tourists, but you know less than permanent, so somewhere in between. They've been living there for a short time, for a couple of months. 
And Joey always said, this is the picture here to the left that he thought is depicting the situation probably the best. And that one looks like it could be Jay here in, in Hawaii because yes, the bus came out with some electric buses. So we have that. It doesn't look quite as streamlined as that one. But we also have this urban nomad, which they otherwise call her homeless, uh, seeking shade there and living out on the street. And there is a shopping cart that's basically his home next to him here. So this is a situation that applies to both of us. And the news call this out and basically say, sorry, it's not affordable anymore, especially for young people living there. And in one of the previous shows, we pointed out that you guys being hit very hard by the last 2008 recession that caused a really high unemployment amongst the youth. And that's still lingering around, right? And now price is going up um, because of people coming. People like, you know, who want to go there and are not from there. So this is the situation. And then people here, they might say, oh, I read to uh, 1200 and uh, there's an exchange rate or not. But let's not go there. I mean, we're, we're both talking about too high prices, right? And we don't want to be nitpicky because you got to consider all the different uh, conditions and situations. Pedro, to give you a little bit of idea why, where we come from and why we address this, this is the situation we have here. So this is some uh, Western cowboy developer, Howard Hughes here, uh, trying to do affordable, or he is actually forced to do affordable. And that's how he's doing. And we've been using our Magnum PI, and actually Rick Orwell Wrighty, uh, a PIing mobile here, and actually was Jay. Uh, it's now confirmed the longest running governor, George Arioshi's wife, Jean Arioshi's car, to begin with. So we're using this to get the the carbon footprint out of it. When you drive it, really rarely, only for occasions like this one here. And it just is uh, colonial, talking uh, Columbus Day, right? Because it's just climatically inappropriate. And would you want to live in there? That's how it's depicted at the bottom right there. So you get that little shoebox with a little hole punched in, and that's going to be your, your paradise. And we had a fellow yeah. European with us, uh, Pedro, here. That is Thomas Auer. He teaches at TUM, and he's a bioclimatic engineer. And when we had uh, the Anmumu, the car, Mumus is what the missionaries threw over the two naked from their point of view locals here, and they threw a Mumu over it. So we take that Mumu off the car, and Thomas and I say, there's still hope. You could do the same with the building. You can take that Mumu off. He's actually really hitting it back with a research he has going on that he calls Einfach Bauen, which means build simple really try to get to the spot and not do more than necessary. And regarding this here, the witty guy he is, he basically said, oh, this would be back to the future if you would do that to the building. So that's us obviously trying to be stay humorous. Sorry, I cut you off. Pedro, you wanted to say something about the previous slide, right? Uh, I know, yeah. I was going to say, at least it has a sea view. <laughs> Well, as long as the next one builds one right in front of you, which is the irony that happens. So that gets us back to you in Barcelona here, Pedro, because it's not like everything is, you know, perfect there. So you're doing things like this here, too, with it's just gentrification. At least it's urban, right? But what we see, Jay, at least it has lanais. It has glass guardrails, parapets that we say we shouldn't do here. But... In all honesty, your winters are a little bit more on the chilly side. So in the spring, you know, and in the late fall, you can actually be kind of cozy behind a glass guardrail, which is a condition that never happens here. So we want to talk about the neighborhood uh, that this is. And this is a run where we actually met when you as a guiding architect, as a member of that gave us a tour, the location that we talked about last week and we'll talk about more in the future is around this neighborhood here. And can you explain this to us where that is and what that is, which is a conversion of uh, an industrial area, right, to housing? This, uh, this picture is from Sants, right? From the Sants neighborhood? Yeah. Or Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the, the Sants neighborhood, yeah, it's uh, it was a partially industrial uh, neighborhood, but it's also been like a, it's it's always been like a mixed a neighborhood uh there's it's it's always been like also residential for from almost from the begin the, the beginning sorry 
um, as opposed to, for example, neighborhood like uh, Poblenó. No, Poblenó is a neighborhood that was like, um, I would say, probably 90% industrial uh, up until the 1960s, more or less. No, so uh, the Sands neighborhood has a, like a more mixed tradition, and you can see uh, it's one of the reasons why there's uh, a lot of um, uh, places like cooperative buildings uh, that are intended for to serve the people who live there. No, uh, we we had the chance to visit one of those reconverted uh, buildings, and it's a it's a very um, it's a neighborhood with a lot of character. No, and I. Don't even. Uh, I, I'm a little surprised because I don't remember exactly where those buildings are that you were seeing on the top picture. No, and I, I don't really identify them very, very precisely. It's okay. You see, on the next picture, we're getting to La Borda, and that's kind of the old factory around it. And you see that new, more upscale housing. Jay, this reminds us of what Kakaako, of course, which used to be former industrial working people. And then top left is us contemplating about its future. And, you know, Kamehameha School, who is the other big land developer, uh, could say, oh, yeah, we do this. We have the salt, which is our kakaako, as they call it, where they actually keep some old buildings. And it's where nightlife goes on. And that's fine. And that's good. But what's not so good is what's uh, around it and even what they do, because this is the same old. And this is where it gets us to get jealous again, because... In this uh, open courtyard here, next on the top right picture is that old factory. You can actually see this very interesting beacon of hope there in the in the distance in the center. And at the bottom, you see when you uh, get uh, get close to it, and that's called La Borda uh, by Lacol, who is the architect, which is a cooperative that you actually introduced me to and toured their office, which we will get to later on in these in these show sequence here. And that was a few years ago. And, and that is exactly what Kamehameha School should do, the very least, and also Howard Hughes. And why would that be we are going to talk about now? And uh, we uh, are currently, uh, Pedro, to put this into the dilemma context that we have, I am working with these guys on this book that we have the unique selling propositions, thanks to UJ, to have QR code extra 28 minutes uh, shows to have the reader also go and watch, and so the the more we come to the to the to the contemporary times, it cuts itself thin because there's so little to include because it's all pretty bad. So this is a project here we had some hopes up when it was under construction, and the soda and I jumped on it. And that's when it still looked like that. And we were thinking about how would it be completed, hopefully with as little as possible. And then they started to throw these sort of, you know, pattern on and perforated panels and substructure for what ended up, unfortunately, glass guardrails, which worked better for you guys. However, for low cost housing, it doesn't work so well, right? Because it is more expensive, as we just saw in, in the neighboring building. So, this is what I get really jealous of because that's how that project did it. And it uses a vernacular traditional way of both uh, creating shade because this facade is facing south and, and at the same time privacy. And it's out of something that few shows ago, Jay, we did one about timber in the tropics. We have a lot of wood here, especially invasive species that would get cut and slice into strips and could do something similar here. How awesome is that? And do you guys agree on that, or am I the only one so overly excited about that? No. I well, the wood that's available yep. locally, and, I don't think the, it's at a, at a level of construction material. Um, yeah, it could so. be too, but this is this is just shading. For shading, you can do it, and you can all hand make this, and you can uh, it's hand operated, so it's really almost too good to be true and. Let's walk towards the building because everything is really, I mean, this is what, what Kamehameha School kind of fetishizes that industrial look. But they didn't put it to the level to really have the people, um, you know, benefiting from it as far as uh, making a living, not just be there for fancy meals, but also for making um, a living there. So this is actually the entrance of the building. 
And I was able to sneak in when a resident came either in or out. So I'm in this courtyard here where you see a lot of things, a lot of just life, right? Attributes of life. Lots of what you are famous for, uh, Jay, because if you ask um, people at McCulley uh, Bicycle and Ben, he recalls you as his buddy from the early bicycling pioneering days. And uh, you got greenery in there, you got scooters there, you got something, you got helmets there, you got everything that we should have here. So this is the plan, and North is up, dear emerging generation, which I always remind them, so now I should do it myself. When you actually go into the building um, and from, from that side, and you're starting to have a lot of communal areas on the ground floor, and up there you have a lot of circulation, and you have a lot of daylight there, and it doesn't rain in because there's a roof that's actually covered there. So then depending on the orientation, you either have plants growing on the parapet or not. You have very, very simple, profane, cheap, but very efficient and effective materiality. And you have, Jay, this is a little bit uh, uh, in, in conflict of what we just discussed, because this is solid timber. You can do buildings multi-story out of solid timber, cross-nailed timber in that case. Technology is out there. We actually did several shows with Emerging Generation that's seriously researching on that. And then once you go up in the building, uh, you have the units here. And the units have provide a variety of sizes and a variety of um, you know, organizations all based on efficiency and effectiveness. And uh, what you see on the left side there uh, is actually a communal space that we see on the plan on the very top there, on the very north facing the street. That's what co-op is about, right? And it's basically about sharing things and not just be by yourself in your space. So this is Martin unprepared, you know, not having an appointment there, but just showing up and sneaking in and by the time I had my, you know, footage in uh, the pictures I showed you, I got that response because I still try to reach out to the management, but more spontaneously. So I got that very welcoming, but probably deserved it kind of message here. Um, <laughs> and so the rest I had to do from outside again. So this is above the entrance, looking up into this communal space. And here comes something that it has, which my former place which is probably the closest from the, the the kind of you know commercial setting we have here but the Waikiki Grand I live the Waikiki Grand until most recently when I got evicted had the most to do with this because it was the most diverse and the most inclusive and it also originally had which now writing about it in the book that I wanted back kicked the realtor out who basically was taking over the former a uh, little uh, mom and pop convenience store. So this actually has on its ground floor an, an, uh, an occupant operated uh, little store that you know people can buy things and walk them right up. And talking sustainability, this is not blah blahing it and get lead points for it. This is actually doing it, guys. And we fall short on that because this Hallinda Hona is this building that sort of is about the best that we can find, but it had such good intentions uh, by get it a mainland developer from the Bronx. Yes, that Bronx from New York City. And he proposed that. And then the local firm WICIT kind of butchered it with their kind of, you know, ornamentation versus going fully because they had proposed to actually have not just sell food, but also grow food. And it's all these little few decorative planter boxes that it came down to. So we want to hold them accountable and say, basically do it, not just talk about it. And now there's like, you know, sofas and couches and whatnot in, in this building here, but you should make it what you've been promising at the beginning to make it a full blown commercial thing for the people. And this is how La Borda looks from the street. And people might say, oh, this is, this is not the most beautiful architecture, but it functions as the most beautiful architecture because it is for the people and it's by the people. And people are either bicycle or they are on scooters here.
And, and when you say that the looking up is even from from an aesthetical point of view, I mean, I don't know if it's grown on me, but I, I like it very much. I mean, I think it's a really beautiful building and the space inside is is amazing. And of course, if you add, if you know everything that goes around it or or the story of where all this comes from, it, it's it's really overwhelming. Yeah. Because well, I like the, the border much better than the buildings you've shown us in Honolulu. See? <laughs> La Borda is, um, you know, at least in part, it's the remodeling renovation of older buildings. And you can't have everything to remodel. But if you have some things a remodel, uh, then you retain the character of the neighborhood. But I had a question for you, Martin. How big are those units? Because the floor plan looks really good, but how big are they? <laughs> they range in, in square footage. You can see, as we would call, like studios. So the center ones are not unlike the the Hollander Hona building, and they always give it these Hawaiian names. Um, and so these are studios, as we would call studios, with basically um, you know a bathroom and and a kitchen in there. But then you have you have bigger units. So the the point is not like what we do here, is where it's basically one size. Uh, you know, fits all. And this, so this building has only the same unit that supposedly fits the worker that is so overworked and underpaid that they can barely afford that. And then they just crash there for the night and then they go back to have their five jobs that they need to pay for this, right? And and again, this is about the best building. So not to end up with no building in the book to end with, this is one of the, this is actually the better one that actually at least had good ambitions. But your point is well taken, Jay, because it's not good enough. And that's the point. We need to get this up and we need to have the, the emerging generation to step up and the people to step up because the, the cooperative is the opposite of the corporate because it's a bottom-up strategy where people get together and they do it, right? And the architecture is actually only the, and this is the slide for it, is the facilitator of the process right and not the the magic ego guy who brands it right and gives it gives it a name but it's actually uh, you know it's it's all done by everyone together they're all in it together and these are pictures that i put uh, took from their website here of the guys that you introduced me to in uh, on your tour and this is user participation and it's prototyping. You see on the left there behind me is that staircase tower that's out of solid timber. And so it's everything is basically kind of what we like to call homegrown, right? Here and what we wish. Well, you know, some of those buildings that, that have been remodeled are pretty old and venerable. They're lovely. It's a lovely canvas to start working on. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I was telling you about my trip to uh, Spain and 1965, um, th those buildings were old and venerable. And and I looked on Google Earth, I found that there's a lot of uh, remodeling going on, at, at least in Madrid. I don't know about, I guess, assume the same in Barcelona. So you have this generation coming up, this generation of creative architects, if you will, that takes these old buildings and makes them new. Now, the problem with Hawaii is, um, this is a Spanish word, Pedro, a lot of the old buildings are shice. It's a Spanish word, and yeah, and you can't you can't French. do much you can't do much with them, so you really have no choice but to knock them down and start again. And when you do that, you find that the cost of construction is very high, and the cost of land occupancy is very high, and so you get um, you know monstrosity skyscraper type of buildings, which are what what will I say they're they're. They're value value oriented, uh, value engineered, um, so that you 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 lose the aesthetic. Yeah, and I think locally here the cooperative uh, of architects uh, now can take this as a great compliment from you because their building is actually of that kind that you explained that. Mm -hmm. They they built and it is a new building, but it's it's so well integrated into the kind of the gritty nature of the surrounding that it actually comes across as it's always been there, right? And that's the beauty of it that it's like the texture of the city is has been continued to ride through these buildings, and there are not these ostentatious 
invasive Columbus colonial things, right? But because they're homegrown, they, they come across as that. So, and this is, this is us now. The building we just saw is on the left something? there. Yeah, please. I wanted to add something regarding the, the disposition of the apartments that you mentioned before, the variety, uh, because uh, I'm not sure if it was clear, but uh, about the this uh, collective process, no, the cooperative is not just the, the, the Office of Architecture that has this system, but actually the whole process of the building. So this means that the the future inhabitants of the building were involved and consulted. And one of the reasons why all the apartments or there's such a variety of apartments is because they were almost customized for uh, the for the future tenants. So uh, it's a it's a complicated process, no. But the fact that they dared to uh, leap into this and they managed to 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 make it work, uh, I think it's a, like a double uh, merit, no, of the of the architecture cooperative. No, thanks for clarifying that. You know, the building you showed us has a courtyard, and it's got yeah. a covered courtyard, but it's clearly a courtyard, and uh, that and and Pedro can confirm this that that is a significant part of um, these venerable buildings in, in both Barcelona and Madrid, courtyards. Um, and so when you look at this, when you look at this, you see a courtyard that might have existed in a building 300 years old. It's reminiscent, and it, it calls historical echoes. Um, and that is really terrific that somebody would have thought to do that. Absolutely right on. And again, per all you said, again, the difference between corporate and cooperative, that corporate is top down and it just sees that desperate need of people and it's just doing that much to be in business, right? And not more because that's going to be less profit. And the cooperative is exactly the opposite where people get together because they said they're going to be cut out by that corporate. So they get together and they chip in, they share all their resources they have, go to uncle and, you know, auntie and grandma and ask for money and, you know, all their savings and they put them all together and then they sort it and they say, well, that's what we have. It's kind of talking indigenous day. It's a very neo-indigenous way of thinking, right? Because the people before globalization had to do the same, right? Do from scratch, from what we have, right? And exactly as you say, uh, Pedro, then they already start to articulate their, their wishes, right? And their desires, but not in an unreasonable way, but in a way like, okay, we know we don't have much, so can we afford this? Can we afford that? So they actually start programming by themselves in not a speculative way as the corporate developer does it and one size fits all, but in a custom way, as you perfectly said, where everyone is different, then they all say, well, I would like this and my family is that size and I'm just by myself, I'm okay with that. But where do we meet and what do we share? And it's a really successful process that starts to become a movement all over Europe. So that's, if anything, is the biggest message to us here in Hawaii to look into that and that's where we're doing these shows and we're going to do uh, many more episodes of this because this is just too fascinating and too successful to not look at guys <laughs> so we're pretty much uh, we walk through this one here and we're pretty much i think we leave you jay with keeping this to the mandatory sort of in half hour but um this is the appetizer for catching up on that in a couple of weeks here, because we're going to walk then into the neighboring building that we see on the on the right side, which is just across the street, which is by other architects, um, um, local architects. And that's that's, again, the beauty that um, you just also employ the local talent, right, which is also not happening here. Not of the none of the awesome, you know, fresh inspired young people who come out of our university that we have can really, um, you know, put their education to work. They they go and work for the few kind of mafia like big firms, 
and they become you know slaves for their corporate practices and that's really something that is seriously wrong so that's the other encouragement here the message is like let these young people go wild and crazy and they will do they will make the difference and uh, so yeah look forward to that uh, building here it's just another one and guess what Jay, what it will have for you, a courtyard. It's also constructed around a courtyard. And you're perfect. Your, your point was perfect that um, they are building on a uh, traditional typology that is nothing, has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with superficiality or something that's, you know, that's, that's a thing you just do. Just think about the first Howard Hughes high rises with these yellow pimples, these huge supposedly common rooms up in the air that no one uses because it's too windy up there and they're furnished horribly. So this is just trying to fake it, but they actually make it here because these courtyards, as you perfectly pointed out, you should have always been my dean and the search is still going on. So drop your, drop your application today for becoming the dean of architecture, Jay because you identified the urban genetic code of the success of these buildings here using a, a, a theme that is actually performative, right? Because a courtyard keeps you cool. That's where, you know, it's always shaded and hot air rises up. And at the same time, the circulation is there. So this is where the people meet. So it's a late entry for your most, um, you know, preferred topic about public spaces and, and spaces, because this is it in a microscopic scale, not in a, in a street scale, but in a community and building scale. This is so exciting, guys. I can't wait to talk next time. Picking up from here, aren't you excited how that building looks from inside? Well, then join in next time for that. A courtyard has space. You may not, you know, have acreage outside, you know, which, you know, back to classical times with lots and lots of acreage, but you do have some space and people can find community there and they can find space there. And that goes to the quality of communal life. So I think it's very important. The other thing I, I want to add now that you're closing is that is that I, I really appreciate you doing this show, Martin and Pedro and Martin as well, um, to, to uh, acculturate Hawaii's architectural thinking to architectural thinking elsewhere. It's very important that we bring these cultures, architectural cultures together, because life will be better for everyone. And we, we can see the quality or perhaps the lack of quality of our own efforts by looking elsewhere. So to look at Barcelona or other places, and see what they're doing, and maybe have some of these students of yours, Martin, um, take some ideas and rebuild, you know, or mm, establish new um, new models for Hawaii would be will be terrific. The only thing, Martin, I leave you with this thought, is that mm, there's no time to waste because these buildings that are going up and poking the sky have a useful life of hundreds of years. And it's really hard to get rid of them. So we have to move as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's true. And although we have Thomas Auer from Munich telling us we could go back to the future and just knock out the glass and inhabit the ruins, right? So there's some hope on that side. We also have a way out there idea of um, weaving additional spaces and places in between the high rises. So there's some very... Uh, my wife calls it spinna ideas. Spinna means spider, but it also means more weird. Uh, and but you're absolutely right. These projects here, and again, um, they're so um, hidden gems because the quality of them is not jumping in your face as here, right? Everyone wants to pimp things and look them as oh, this is the coolest, newest. I would want to be in there. But it's just the same old thrown with a little different bling on it. But these buildings here are not sufficient, they're substantial. And they recognize climate as something that is absolutely necessary to design with climate. So from the outside, it's the building at the top left with the shutters. And you see them in the uh, picture behind me here as well. So these shutters are 
another vernacular element, Pedro, right, that, that are traditional in um, Mediterranean architecture that you actually needed back then where air conditioning wasn't even invented. So you needed them. So it's just reintroducing these vernacular things and architects there do that instead of jumping on some superficial, you know, stardom things that uh, would make them be on the title pages of whatever magazines that you don't want to read. They're really interested in making a difference, right? And making that impossible work to have, you know, have people continue to live in the city, not having to go out into the burbs, which you, Pedro, you shared with us, you have as well, and you're kind of living out there, way out there. So that's a reality too. So it's a real achievement to allow the people and the little people and all people to stay in the city and keep making it the city, right? Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's go into that building next time in a couple of weeks. And until then, stay um, very happy and healthy and optimistic. But also, yes, get it done, Jay. No time to waste. Right on. And Pedro, you too. Hopefully, you're an educator just as well. Be inspired by us here in Hawaii and have your emerging generation jump and do some exercising, do some investigating in us. We should do some collaboration and go do an exchange and go both ways. Sounds interesting. Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, more on that next time. Thank you all for being here and uh, see you, see you all back for our picking up from here. Bye-bye.